All right, five, four, three, two, and welcome to another amazing addition to the Build Out Loud podcast. It is I, one of your co-hosts, Matt the VC, aka Matt Conwell. If you follow me on Twitter, it's at Matt Conwell. I'm here with my co-host Liam Gill. What's going on, Liam? How you doing today? I'm doing good. It's uh, nice to be back recording this. Uh, the people won't know this, but it's been a few weeks break for us. We've been taking a break, but I'm sure if you listen to these, they'll probably be coming out every week. So little uh magic in the background, but happy to be back at it. It's been a while, man. And so I uh, want to get into today's episode, going to talk about something interesting. Um, I recently got to read this Medium article by a gentleman by the name of Aaron Dinan, D-I-N-I-N. And this Medium article is entitled, I became friends with one of my investors, and I think it may have killed my startup. And for me, as a founder first type of VC who is extremely friendly with many of my uh, entrepreneurs, this one kind of struck a chord with me. So kind of wanted to dig into this. But before we get any deeper, let's give a shout out to our amazing sponsors. And we're back. All right. So Liam, have you ever created a friendship with one of your investors? Yeah, I've had like a few investors who have obviously had some sort of close relationship with or like over time kind of develop a friendship. Uh, obviously, some people who you meet before you ever ask them for money and you've got their uh, number, they're kind of people you turn to for advice before you ever turn to for money. Uh, it's an interesting topic. Obviously, you know, I haven't really thought about this. I've never gone through the process of like thinking about whether or not I should raise money for friends. So when you brought up the topic, it was what I wanted to talk about because moving forward, there's a chance I raise at some point. There's a chance that, you know, I want to work with people. And obviously I'm at a stage where a lot of those people I would want to work with are friends or people who at the very least I might turn to. Uh, in my experience, I would say there's probably one person who... I was very close with in terms of relying on as a actually before you jump into that you know i just jumped in asking you the question i should probably give some context on this medium article right and so for anybody who doesn't follow aaron on medium you should he's prolific he, he writes a lot of blog posts or medium articles but in this particular article the the thing he was getting at was he had developed a friendship with one of his investors, and that investor has now become a really close friend. But because of that, he felt like this investor started getting started to give him advice as a friend, as opposed to advice that's best for the company. So this investor's advice was always layered with what he thought was best for Aaron and not what he thought was best for the company. And Aaron felt like that could have been problematic in the growth of the company. And, you know, I know I am um, definitely, definitely, you know, done this before, right? Like, I am at fault of this one. Um, and I think it's a really interesting point of how important is it for your investors to be a purely business relationship so that the information and the advice you're getting is always business advice? Or can you have that friendship and still make sure that investor has that frame of thought of, the advice I want you to give me is what's best for the company, not what's best for me, which can be hard to hear, right? Because like, if I as an investor give you information that's best for the company, it may be drastically different than what you as a founder want to do, right? And could actually cause conflict. But in general, that conflict is probably a positive thing for the business because sometimes founders aren't thinking about the business. They're thinking about self-interest. And so now with that context, Liam, what do you think? Yeah, no, that's some good context. And it also gave me eight minutes to prepare instead of four. Uh, so I I still I still think the original story I was going to tell still applies, although slightly, I'm going to frame it around that same context. So it was an investor who I'd met three years before I ended up raising funds from him. And three, you know, at that time, three years before, you know, there was never really like an idea of him giving money, at least not any time, you know, in the short term, he was a VC, but it was just like his interest and in what I was interested in doing, like completely mismatched. And we both knew that from the start. And over the years, he gave me advice. Uh, you know, he both like solicited and unsolicited. He helped me out quite a bit. And then when he invested 
the relationship didn't really change. It was like, I could go to him both for business advice or personal advice. And a lot of times I was quite clear, like which one I was looking for and got advice, advice accordingly. The one thing that stands out though, when talking about giving advice for the person or giving advice for the company is that at the time when I was thinking of leaving the company, so at the time when my co-founder and I had a bit of a difference in terms of like what the plan forward was, we didn't really see eye to eye on the strategy for the company. This particular investor, I think, had the opinion that my co-founder's idea for the company was better. And he felt that the company would benefit from me not being better. But at the same time, he thought that I was a very good entrepreneur and was going to have a crazy amount of success. He just didn't think it was going to be with this company with the strategy that I had. So actually, before I ever left the company, he made the point to me that if I did decide to step down and if I did let my co-founder take over, he would fund me on my next venture. And that is obviously something that if you're looking at it purely from an investor in this company point of view, it, it's like a pretty big conflict of interest in some ways to, you know, try to give me, you know, for, I, I get from his perspective, he's kind of double dipping. He thinks that I'm a good entrepreneur. He thinks that my co-founder has a good idea. He's like, well, I'm going to back both separately. Uh, but obviously it's other investors who may now be hearing that or know that that happened. They may not be that happy that like, you know, before I made the decision to leave, there was one person who was already invested in our company who was offering me money to go do something else. Like that the decision was, was framed differently for me because this wasn't, something I needed to be fully invested in because someone was giving me a way out and it was someone with, you know, on our cap table. So I think that, I think that's an interesting way of phasing the question. And, you know, does it come down to that for someone like you? Do you get to a point where there's a company you love, they're, they've grown and you potentially think that the founder is no longer a fit, but you love the guy or you love the girl and, you know, you think that they'll do amazing things somewhere else. You know, what is your responsibility there in terms of advising that person versus advising the company? Because to a large extent, you, you know, even if that person might not be suited to be CEO anymore, you probably don't want to completely have them leave the company on a whim, especially to go start another company. I think if you were not invested in that new company, you definitely wouldn't, wouldn't want that happening. Uh, so I think I think that's that's an interesting way to phrase it. And I think that that is my personal experience in anything related to this is having that person who was trying to balance both interests and who did something that, in my opinion, very clearly showed a preference for, you know, backing me over backing the company in some ways. Yeah, I, I don't know, it's difficult because, you know, such a people-driven business, right? And as somebody who invests really early, because very often I'm the first or one of the first investors in the company. And so uh, my relationship with the founders tend to be different, tend to be stronger. As I go, the first person who backs you and thinks and believes in you is the one you you never forget, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm that person. And so it becomes hard because, you know, you do develop relationships with these folks. And there are these moments where the things that are best for the business aren't necessarily best for that individual. Are, are, are necessarily what that individual wants. Um, but I also had the frame of knowing that when I make an investment, as much as I'm investing in people, I'm investing in the company, right? And so over the growth life of the company, I expect the CEO to change a few times, right? Like, like if you were an early investor in OpenTable, OpenTable's had nine CEOs, right? You kind of got to ride with it as new ones come. So I try to make sure and be as balanced as I can focused on the future of the company. But there are moments where you do give, you know, the entrepreneur you have a relationship with some personal advice that may be counter to what's the best for the company. And you hope they make the best decision for the company, right? Um, so that's a difficult one. Uh, I will say that this medium article that I referenced has made me think about it harder. It is something that I try to check when I have conversations with my entrepreneurs now, like I have internal dialogue, like am I am I doing saying this because this is what's best for the company or was this what's best for the founder? 
um, and doing what's best for the company instead of what's doing what's best for the founder can lead to more difficult conversations. But it's those difficult conversations that companies grow from. So I'm trying to lean more and more in that direction. But um, I've done something similar to what your investor has done, where I've uh, been with the company. I've invested in the company where one of the co-founders was clearly not right for that company. And so I let that co-founder know, like, hey, if you leave, go start something else. I'll back that. Just that you being here is probably not a, the best place for you to be. Was that was best for the company? In my estimation, it is. It's exactly what was best for the company. But I do understand, like, you know, maybe not every investor on, in the company feels that way. Right? And so there's a little give and take there. So I get it. It's a tough one. It's a conundrum. Yeah, I think it's a, I'm going to bring a weird perspective into this, maybe a bit of a different one, which is as when you work in law and when you're in law school, one of the hardest things that I've seen a lot of classmates and colleagues struggle with is when working specifically in corporate law, which is what I do, is this idea that your client is the company. And this is something that like a lot of lawyers, even like the lawyers who you know, practice for 10, 15, 20 years, if they haven't worked specifically in corporate law, they really, really struggle with this idea. And that's specifically because you need to be able to separate the CEO, the founder, whoever's talking to you as a lawyer from the company. So let's say there's a CEO that comes to me and they, they run a company and they tell me that they want to, you know, sell the company or they want to get, you know, special shares with extra voting power. You know, obviously, as a lawyer, you kind of need to do what they say because you're going to get fired if you don't. But at the same time, it's your job to advise the company, not the CEO. So you need to like run this really weird balance of, in your mind, understanding what the CEO is telling you and how much of it is for his benefit or her benefit and how much of it is for the company's benefit and to make sure that however you're acting, you're acting for the company. And I think it's it, it's kind of framing the role of a VC in the same way, which is that you need to be able to differentiate and understand what advice you're giving and who that advice is for. And I think like an, an, a very easy way to conceptualize it is when there's an employee who does something, you know, illegal or something in uh, in their job. And, you know, they think that like, the company lawyers are going to stand up for them. But in reality, the company lawyers are there to make sure the company doesn't get sued. Like, they really don't give a fucking rat's ass if that employee gets sued. Like, you, you, it's easy to understand it at that level when you're dealing with someone who's potentially expendable versus, you know, a massive corporation. But it gets a lot harder to separate the interests when you get to a CEO or a founder or someone you know, especially the early stage of company where the person is the company. At the end of the day, like, you know, we've all been there at the startup stage where it's hard to get a bank account. It's expensive to, you know, pay different like fees. You might not have a credit card. Like a lot of things are going through personal bank accounts. You know, sometimes companies aren't even incorporated yet. And you're struggling to separate the two and to see how, you know, the company can survive without the person, the person survives without the company and, you know, how the two are interl uh, interlinked. And I remember having a conversation with, our accountant when our company was around six or eight months old, because we had rented a, like uh, an office space and I was living in the office space and the company obviously couldn't lease it because we didn't have enough money or history. So I personally leased it and expenses of the company. And he was making the point that like legally I was like a landlord and I had to report, like I had to pay the rent and then take rent from the company. And then I had to pay taxes on that. And I was like, no, there's no way I'm doing that because like there's there's no one that's hurting other than the company because I have no fucking money. If I have to pay taxes, that money is coming from the company and like we can't afford that. We've only got like 20 grand in the bank. I can't afford to be getting like two grand to the government just because like you don't want to say that the company is leasing this because legally they can't because we don't have enough like money to get a lease. Like it's, it's very difficult, I think, separating out founders from startups. But I think that's an interesting way to frame it, is to think of uh, ultimately who you're giving the advice to and to try your best in the way that a lawyer would to like very clearly enunciate who your client is or who the person that you're advising is 
and to make sure that you know that founder or that ceo or you know those people on the management team know that when you're giving them advice you're giving it either in your role as a friend or in your role as a vc and to try to keep those two separate because at the end of the day the two are going to come in conflict a lot more than many founders or vcs would like to admit and if you have this habit of merging the two there might come a day when you know you've got a multi-billion dollar company and they're coming to you for you know business advice but you end up getting personal advice and that it's costing other investors you know hundreds of millions like it, it it does become a problem down the line if that becomes the norm so i think there is something to trying to create a type of separation early on and to try to make it clear in the same way that like lawyers accountants and other people need to when you're giving advice and who you're giving it to specifically i don't think that that would hurt vcs to try to start doing that i agree and uh that is something that like with the founders who I am friendly with, I do have this moment where I'd be like, right now I'm talking to you, Mac the friend, not Mac the investor. And other times I'm, like, I'm talking to you, Mac the VC. This is, this is going to be a VC conversation. It's going to feel very different. Um, but I think it's, it's very important that as a VC that I keep the relationship as professional as possible and, and let it be known that you know these conversations are about the business. And so we're here to talk about what's best for the business. Um, but you know, those conflicts will arise and make things difficult. Um, and I will say just having a cold hearted, this is purely a business and only a business relationship, uh, has its own unintended consequences as well, right? Like these are still human interactions and everybody's human. So gotta try and understand that. Now, what does that mean for founders? For those of you who are listening in, it means you want to be clear when you're have building a relationship with an investor to understand what kind of advice you're getting. You want it to be very, very clear. Are they giving you advice because they like you and they're giving you what's the best advice for you as a person? Or are they giving you the best advice for the company, right? Like that's the dilemma. And that's something you want to be clear with and you want to understand where you stand with your investors, especially your earliest investors, the one you get to know and spend time with and grow with, right? You want to know where you stand and why. And just understand, like, whatever relationship you build with that individual is going to color the kind of advice they give you, whether on purpose or not, whether intended or unintended. So something to keep in mind. Any last thoughts for the folks before we get up out of here, Liam? Yeah, I think I think it's generally a good practice as a founder to try to separate yourself from the company. And to like, I think it's a good intellectual exercise in a lot of ways. Because I've I've been there before, you've been there before. Like that company is your life, and in a lot of ways, like your identity is tied to it. Uh, we talked about you know a lot of stuff in this area about how it's just a unique relationship. But there is benefit in really understanding where your interests deviate from the companies, and it's not just in terms of relationships with VCs. Like as I said, you know, relationships with lawyers, accountants, other people like that, it'll help with relationships with mentors, with friends, like. Some of your mentors might know what's best for the company and they might know what's best for you. And that, they might know that's not the same thing. And you need to be able to be clear about, you know, who you're getting advice for and who they're trying to help here. But even further than that, there's going to be instances where like you and the company are directly in conflict, even though you might not see it that way. That would include, should I take a salary? Like a very common question, you know. Most founders say, you know, I don't want to take a salary because I want to help the company, but is that really the right position to take? Like, are you going to put your interests aside for the companies or should you take a salary and hurt the company? You know, this, it's just, I'm, I'm not saying that one is right or one is wrong, but it's worthwhile recognizing that there is inherently built into the way that companies are founded, a conflict of interest between founders and the company. And if you don't understand that, in the early going and you don't get used to recognizing when you're doing things for you and when you're doing things for the company, it's very easy to fall into traps where, you know, we've heard of CEOs who spend millions of dollars and like parties and, you know, just blow company money on shit that, you know, they should be spending them themselves. You get, you get the opposite side, which is CEOs who defer salaries for years and years, raise you know, tens of millions and then walk away with next to nothing. You know, it's, it's just important to 
understand your interest, understand the company's interest, and try to some extent to separate the two, even if it's not going to change the way you act in the early stage, it's going to help you when you get to a series A, series B, series C, and there's a lot of money at stake and investors and other third parties are in there looking only at the interests of the company or looking only at your interests and for you to understand why they see things differently than you or why they're taking certain approaches. If you've never trained yourself to think about yourself and the company as separate, you're going to get to a point where that's really going to hurt you because you're really not going to understand why people are making strategic decisions, why people want you out, like why people want you to change. Like all these things become a lot harder to analyze if you continue to look at yourself and the company as the same thing, which in the early days, it really will feel like that. But as you move on, it definitely isn't the truth, like legally speaking or just practically speaking. Like there'll come a point where the company is so big, it pretty much runs without you. And you need to be able to accept that and to understand that and to really mentally when you're making decisions, separate your interests from the companies. And when you hear opinions from other people, when you hear advice, feedback, criticism, to know who that's geared towards. So you don't take it personally if it's for the company. So you don't take personal advice and use it, you know, as a CEO in a way that hurts the company. You know, there's just a lot of problems with conflating the two. And I think from an early stage, if you're mentally aware of the difference, you're going to be successful in the long run. I think that fundamentally, that's just a very good exercise to do. Amazing advice and a great exercise because it's such a difficult one. Um, it can be really, really difficult to remove yourself from the company and look at it objectively. So the sooner you start the practice and getting used to like thinking about your company as if it wasn't yours, like just looking at it from like a third party lens, the better off you'll be long term. Amazing advice from you, Peter. Um, well, I think that's a great place to end this one on. Thank you so much, Liam, for another amazing episode. Appreciate you, brother, as always. And shout out to all of our amazing listeners to the Building Out Loud podcast. Feel free to reach out to us. Shoot us emails at buildingoutloudpodcast at gmail.com. That is buildingoutloudpodcast at gmail.com. Shoot us your comments, your questions. Let us know what topics you want us to hit. Feel free to reach out, reach out to us on Twitter. Liam and I are both relatively uh, active, me more so than Liam, but we are here for you. And oh, by the way, before we get out of here, Liam, you have a startup. What's the name of your company and why does it exist? Yeah, well, the name of the company might be changing soon as it grows, but for now, uh, lawforstartups.com. And for all the founders out there, you get a twice weekly newsletter with whatever up-to-date legal information you might need, whether that's new cases, new legislation, whatever the hell is going on. And you also get upwards of 60 free legal templates. So you can save some money on, you know, those founder agreements, employment agreements, you know, whatever it is you need at those early stages, save a few thousand, use a template, uh, and, you know, put that money towards something that'll actually get you some customers and grow the business. That's lawforstartups.com. Check it out. And I hope everybody enjoyed this amazing episode. Peace out, y'all.